All right, they're going to take up the offering, but if you would take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 9. I told you earlier we were going to uh, continue in this sermon series, and we've um, heard some things in this series already that we've tried to attribute to our lives. We've heard that we are a called people. We are called to a relationship with Him. We are called to join in His work. We have heard that we are unique. Of course, some of you already knew that about yourself, but we are unique. We are ordinary people with an extraordinary message. That's what makes us unique, that we give to everyday people. We have seen that we are being constantly trained and groomed and sculpted into something that He will use for incredible things on this earth, and we are prepared for ministry. Today I want to take just a a little bit of a turn and talk about uh, an attribute or a behavior that we are to take very seriously, and that's the behavior of confession. Now I know it sounds like we're going a little Catholic on you today, talking about confession and singing about the holy water on our skin and all of those things, but I can assure you that we will uh, not be Catholic today. We'll be very Protestant in our teaching and in our hearing. Um, This morning, I I gave that warning too, that it sounded like we're being Catholic today, but we ended up Pentecostal because I was preaching and a woman fell out right there in the service. I'm not kidding, she fainted. It 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 was kind of of scary there at first. She's okay, but that did happen in the first service. So if somebody faints beside you, just assume they're asleep so you won't cause a commotion for anyone else if you would. That'd be great. I'm just kidding. Care for them. That was mean. I'm sorry. All right, in Luke chapter 9, we're going to see what, um, we're going to read about what Thomas was talking about. Superhero cupcake guy. We're going to uh, see that Jesus gave his disciples an opportunity to publicly confess who he was. Now we use the word confess and profess kind of interchangeably. They, they meant something pretty specific in Bible times, but we can use them, we can still use them inter- interchangeably. When we profess something, that means to share our beliefs. Well, that's what confession about is about too, and both of those have this idea of, of doing that publicly as a part of that service. Confession is sometimes in our society used to talk about the negative things that we've done. In profession is used to talk about the positive things that we believe. But in biblical times they were kind of the same thing. They were an expression of things inside of us, sometimes hidden things, sometimes things not spoken about, in a way that other people would know that about us. So when we confess in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that we, are, we have sinned, and He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, right? We're confessing that hidden part of our lives. We're admitting to those things. I confess to you that um, I, I prefer donuts over cupcakes. Everybody knows that. I confess to you. So it's not always a negative confession. But profession is... Me telling you what I believe to be true, specifically about Jesus. Uh, D.L. Moody started this thought when he he announced uh, a a weird stat that I'm pretty sure he made up on the spot, by the way. But he said nine out of ten Christians never profess Christ publicly. They never admit that He is Lord of their lives, the Son of God. They never get to that stage in their, their spiritual maturity where they feel comfortable talking about that. He says only really one in ten people do that in his experience. Well, let me just let you in on the, the main point for today, okay? The main point is, is that public confession of Christ is both the proof and the responsibility of every disciple of Jesus. Amen. Did you catch that? That's, uh, that's the proof of that it's real in our lives, and that's the responsibility we have of following Him. Now, let's look in Luke chapter 9, and we'll start with verse 18. We're only going to read three verses, and, um, and then we'll unpack it, okay? So, and now it happened that as He was praying alone, the disciples were with Him, and He asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others said, Elijah, and others, that one of the prophets of the old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? 
And Peter gave that great, that great response. And Peter answered, the Christ of God. This, was, this story is mentioned in three out of four of the, of the Gospels. And one response says, Peter uh, responded by saying that uh, you are, uh, this one, you are Christ, the Christ of God. And others, he answered, you are the Christ, the anointed one sent by God. He, uh, in another one, he says, you are the Christ. Simply, you are the Christ. All of them use the word Christ. Christ is an interesting word. Every middle schooler in the house thinks that Christ is the last name of Jesus, but it's so much more than that. Christ is the word uh, Christos, where we most often translate uh, today as Messiah. It's a sent one, an anointed one, some sent by God on purpose. And this purpose, of course, is to redeem humanity. And so when he's given the opportunity to say, who do you think, uh, who do you say that I am? When they use the word Christ, it is, it's really a turning point in his, in his ministry. But before we get to that, let me just ask you, do you find it odd, this wording right here at the very beginning, that he was praying alone and the disciples were with him? That's kind of oxymoronic, but you got to think, everywhere that he went, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people following him. Everywhere that he went. Hanging on his words. Begging for something to happen. Asking for healing. Everywhere he went. And so for him, and, he, and, and taking just 12 of his disciples with him, that was pretty much getting by himself. Getting alone by himself. And he needed those times. And he asked those disciples something very odd said, uh, who do they say that I am? The first thing that this passage really jumps out at me is that Jesus wants his disciples to know what other people think about him. They want us to know, he wants us to know what everyone out there thinks about him and who he is. That's important for us to know. Now, it's funny that he should ask that question because we just studied last week. Remember, we just studied last week that the, the, the Pharisee had Jesus in his house and, they, and, the, uh, and Jesus uh, knew the Pharisee's mind because the Scripture says, and the Pharisee said to himself, if he knew who, who it was that was washing his feet, he would dismiss her and not have her touch him. And Jesus addressed his thoughts. So is he really wondering what people are thinking about him? I don't think so. It's the same kind of question that your parents might ask you, um, where were you, where, where did you go last night? And if your parents have Life360 or some app like that on, on your phone and their phone, they, knew, they know exactly where you are. They just want to know, are, 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 are you being honest about it? Right? See if you're going to be honest with them about that. Well, Jesus knew these things. It's as if Jesus took Life360 and the Ring Video doorbell service and the GPS and ESP and a GoPro and combined them all together. He knows everything that's going on with us. All of it. He knows where we're going, what we're doing, who we're spending time with, what we're saying, and what we are thinking. We can't get by with a thing with anything. Jesus knows. We call this the omniscience of Christ. He knows everything there is to know. So why would he ask them this question? Who do the crowds say that I am? I don't think he was inquisitive about what the crowds were saying at all. I think he was testing the disciples. Because we need to know what others think of Jesus if, if we're going to um, discuss Jesus with them. We need to know their misconceptions, know their, their purposes, know with clarity what they think. In fact, I think it's for clarity's sake that Jesus asked this question. People are mistaken about who Jesus is. Then they thought he was just a Nazarene carpenter's son or a rebel against the Pharisees. The reincarnation of some great man in the past. Others called him a magician. Do you know today, 
Some think that Jesus is the twin brother of the devil. Have you heard that? It's a real thought. It comes from the Eastern religion of, the, of where they use the yin and the yang, where there's equal good and bad. And since the devil's so powerful, Jesus must be so powerful, just as powerful. And so there's this balance in all of, of creation. It's crazy thinking that the devil is Jesus' brother. That would make the devil the son of God. That's false, but people believe that. There's a guy in my family that actually said that the most powerful Jesus in the Bible was baby Jesus because he had all that power in a little bitty body. It was concentrated. <laughs> he, he doesn't understand that either. In fact, where I used to work building mobile homes, if you went in there and asked to speak to Jesus, they would tell you, well, Jesus is building roofs down there on, on section three. Or he's over here in the cabinet shop. There's a Jesus over there too. Everyone has misconceptions of who Jesus is. And for clarity, we need to know what their misconception is. How will we ever address that if we don't understand what that is? Did you know, you, you would be surprised. You would be shocked at the books in the library of any Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. There is every bit of scripture from every religion there is. There's books on, on every kind of lifestyle, every kind of choice, every kind of sin, every kind of misconception, every false religion. They're all in there. And you would think, why are those in there? Isn't that just defiling the, the Southern Baptist um, Theological Seminary Library? No. We were required to read those things. Why? Because we have to talk about them with people. They have misconceptions. We got to talk about those things with people. We need to understand those things. So for clarity, he asked, what are they saying about me? Also for contrast, he asked this question. You see, people lump Jesus into the same file as as everyone else who is spiritually um, uh, above, right? And so in people's file on their computer or in their filing cabinet or in their mind, they're going to have a file, and then that file is going to be the life of Jesus, the life of Muhammad, the life of Buddha, the life of Joseph Smith, the life of Billy Graham. All those religious people are in the same file. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus is in a file all by himself, there is no one like Jesus. None of those others ever claimed to be Jesus then was killed for it and then rose again proving that he was the Son of God. None of them claimed that except him. He is a one of a kind, true living God. And there are no others like him. And so we have to draw that contrast. He's in a class all by himself. So for clarity and contrast, he asked that question. But also he sets us up for uh, apologetical type ministry. Apologetics is not saying I'm sorry. Apologetics is being able to argue the points of your faith. To stand up for what you believe in. And so we need to understand those things. Otherwise we'll be blindsided when someone hits us. And it's almost like the molesting of our faith. And we're in a corner somewhere all shriveled up in our, in our faith. Oh Jesus I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. So we need to know those things for clarity for contrast for apologetics Jesus wants his disciples to know what other people think of him but Jesus also wanted to know what the disciples thought of him this is a more pertinent question for us in Matthew 16 it's recorded that Peter's response was you are the Christ the son of the living God in Mark chapter 8 you are the Christ in Luke chapter 9 you are the Christ of God Christos, the Messiah, the anointed one. It means that Jesus was the one that was anointed to do the great redemptive work of the Father. More than a prophet or a priest or a king. He was the one that was spoken of by Isaiah and Daniel when they referred to him as the soon coming Messiah, the Prince. Messiah in Genesis chapter 3 was referred to as the seed of a woman. In Deuteronomy 18, he was referred to as the prophet like unto Moses. Psalm 110, the Christ is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. 
In Isaiah 11, Messiah is the rod out of the stem of Jesse. In Isaiah 7, the Messiah is Emmanuel, the virgin's son. In Isaiah 4, he is the branch of Jehovah. And in Malachi 3, the Messiah is spoken of as the messenger of a new covenant. And we've covered all of these things in the last few months. And the Old Testament is full of prophecies about the Messiah, about Christ. This is he of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. I read one blog on the internet. He had an interesting take on this. He says, to believe that Jesus is the Christ is to believe that he is the anointed, the Messiah of the prophets, the Savior sent of God, and that he was, in a word, what he claimed to be. This is to believe the gospel by the faith of which alone men can be brought unto God. Did you catch that? Unless he is the Christ, he cannot bring men to God. He's the testimony of God. And that's what constitutes us. That's what makes up us as disciples. He is the Christ. He is Messiah. It's what forms our faith. Jesus wants his disciples to know who he is. But thirdly, Jesus wants his disciples to confess that he is the Son of God. This was a huge turning point in in Jesus' ministry in the last three years of his life. This was a big turning point for him. This was kind of going from, oh, I'm going to show them, to, oh, I'm going to get her done. It was that kind of moment for him. Because right after Peter confessed, you are the Christ, he said, do not tell anyone this. Don't tell anyone this. He had things to accomplish before his arrest. And if they had told this, he would have been arrested immediately. And there were some things that he had to do. On this side of the timeline, this side of the split after the, the cross and the empty tomb, we can confess as openly and honestly and loudly as we want. We don't have to wait on anything because when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, that means we are free to share exactly what he did based on who he was. And if we publicly confess this, maybe others will seek and believe too. See, the truth is that the world thinks that this is a, a fanciful, whimsical, fantastical writing that's based on, on teachings for, for right living. And in order for man to control the masses, there must be a man-made history the truth is, this is, this is his story. This is his, and it's God-made, and it tells us exactly who Jesus is. We don't need all of the miracles. We don't need all of the, the life after death uh, examples. We don't need those things because we have it. It doesn't have to happen anymore. We have it. And so we confess who Christ is. Jesus wants his disciples to do that very thing. It's his desire that all men become saved, follow his direction, and reflect who he is. We have to confess that he is the Son of God. I told you earlier, the main point is that public confession of Christ is a proof and the responsibility of every disciple of Jesus. So I tell you, you must confess Christ. You have to confess Christ. You have to say, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you came to seek and save that which was lost. I believe you died on a cross to pay the penalty for sin. And I believe you rose again on the third day proving your divinity and proving the offer that you're going to give us eternal life. And I will make my beliefs known so that others will see that too and begin to consider these claims for themselves and turn to you. We must confess Christ. It sounds a little Catholic today, but have you confessed today? Are you ready to confess today? 
If you confess Christ as exactly who he says you who he says he is, you must confess that you are exactly who he says that you are. Hear the the hard truth. He says that you are sinful from birth. He says that you are a person who is an enemy of God. He says that you are lost and in need to be found. He says that you are a person deserving death and eternal separation from God in a sinner's hell. But he also says, you are worth leaving heaven and searching for. You are worth dying for. You are a person that God is willing to forgive. And you are a person that God is willing to make new and save for eternity. Will you confess Christ today for the very first time in your life? Will you confess Christ today? Maybe you have never done that. Someone's never plainly told you what's at stake. I want to plainly tell you today. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that we've not met the standard. We've fallen short of the standard of God, the glory of God. Romans 6.23 that says, teaches us that because of that living, we deserve to be separated from God forever, to die in our sin. But Romans 5.8 tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Romans 10, we're taught that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised us from the dead, we'll be saved. We're taught in Romans 10 that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And we're taught in Romans chapter 8, 1, that if we do that, there is no longer any condemnation for us. That separation and death is not a part of our future destiny ever again, ever again. There is a lot at stake in professing Christ for the first time. Some people in the room, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, and I know what that's like. I remember days of feeling purposeless and meaningless. There's nothing real to hold on to, nothing real to stand on. I remember that. Always looking at at things and saying, there's got to be more than this. I'm going to tell you, I was where you are and now I'm where I am and I can tell you I know there is more than that life. It is Christ who makes the difference. Will you confess Him today? But Christian, will you commit to confess Christ Are you one of the 9 out of 10 that D.L. Moody was talking about? It's one thing to stand in here and raise your arms and and praise God among people who want you to do that. It's another thing to go out the door and do that out there in a restaurant, a sporting event, in a job, in a classroom, in a family that doesn't want to hear it. It's another thing to do that out there. Christian, will you commit to confess Christ openly and publicly in all areas of your life? Remember what I read at the very beginning of the service. He who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. And he who denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Listen, I know what it's like to be backed into a corner and to have your faith beat up on. I I know that. I've been around very reasonable, intellectual people who don't understand the, the miraculous nature of God and can't possibly understand that. And so they'll back you into a corner and talk you into inferiority. I know what that feels like, but it's only a feeling. It's only a feeling. J.C. Ryle said, It's better to confess Jesus a thousand times now and be despised by men than to be disowned by Christ before God on the day of judgment. Not only that He is who He said He was, but He is the Lord and Master of your life. He's the sustainer and the Savior of your very existence. 
All the good things in your life come from Him, James teaches us. And all the things that are not seemingly so good also come from Him to make us better and reflect who He is to those around us. He alone gives us reason and purpose and identity. He alone gives us perfect guidance and overwhelming comfort. Christian, you have to confess this to a world that's hurting. You have to do this. Will you confess Christ openly in public in all areas of your life, not just in the church house? To be a disciple, you must confess Christ. I explained to you last week about the altar, and I want to keep reminding you of that. During the music and, and during the rest of the week, this is a stage. But at invitation time, this turns into something else. This turns into an altar where we meet God and we commit to God and we publicly profess that we need God and that we want Him. And so every time that we sing this song after the sermon, it's called an altar invitation where you can come and just put your hand on the altar and say, God, I, I confess I need you. And I confess I'm struggling making that known out there, but I, I need you, God, and I commit I'm going to try to do that better this week. I'm going to try to do that better this week. And then there's men standing at the altar for those who for the first time they need to profess Christ and say, I need Him. I want salvation. I want that kind of relationship with God. But I don't know how to get it. And there's men at the corners that are always there every single time during this song to say, I can tell you how to find God. I can point you to God. I can pray with you and you can be saved today. Both instances are public professions of faith public confession of the Christ and I invite you to take advantage of something that you never do and that is to utilize the public commitment at the altar every Sunday I invite you to that without fail I invite you to make public confessions and commitment to a better week, a better walk with Christ. Some of you for the first time, some of you for the 101st time. Take advantage of that today. As the praise team comes, I want to lead you in a prayer. And then we will have an altar invitation. And there will be guys on either side. And the altar is open for you to come and place your hand and say, I commit my life anew and afresh to you. I invite you to do that. Father, your word is obvious. You're not asking us to do something impossible, but you're not asking us to do something easy either. But you didn't embrace easy life when you were here. You took up your cross and you walked up that winding road you did that. And so if you command your son to do that, if you command the wind to go, and the, if you command the rocks to cry, I, I'll follow your command too. God, I pray that there's some in the room who've never settled this. They've never settled this. You'd give them boldness to settle this today, to put their hand in one of these men on the corners of the stage and say, I need a relationship with Christ. And God, I know that you will offer that to them because you promised in your word, if we confess, you are faithful and just to forgive and you allow the Holy Spirit to come in our lives and seal us for eternity. You promised that. God, I ask that you would do this very thing today. And there's others in the room, God. There's others in the room that are struggling they're open in here and they're honest in here. But because of, their, because of their fear, they're not out there. God, I ask you to make them bold as lions. And as they come and put their hand on the altar and say, I'm committed to you. I'm committed to a, a deeper walk with you and a better week with you. You will fill them with boldness to do that very thing, to confess like Peter did. When if anyone else would have heard, they would have taken his life. We confess that you are the Christ. 
Father, give us the boldness of lions. And we commit these things to new to you for your glory alone. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.